Um, okay. All right. So uh, thank you, everybody, for your patience. And we're now going to get the Maker Talk started. Again, I'm Molly Stratton. I'm the host. I'm coming to you from the basement of the Martin Luther King Library in the Fab Lab. And our presenter today is Beth Karenbauer. Uh, Beth runs a jewelry making business called Painting Stones. And uh, she makes her jewelry out of all kinds of unusual things. So take it away, Beth. Tell us how you make your jewelry. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. And I want to thank everyone for being here with me today. I also want to thank the DC Public Library for allowing this kind of conversation to take place where makers can really just share what they do. Um, I think a lot of times in the media, we focus on how do you do that? You know, the DIYs and how do you make it? I think sometimes a more revealing question for makers is why do you do what you do? Why do you choose this medium? Why do you make these types of things? So I'm hoping to give you some insight into why I do these things, which may be a little unusual at times. I thought I would start with answering three questions that I get a lot. The first question is, why is your business named Painting Stones? The second question is, where do you get your inspiration? And the third question is, where do you get all the stuff that you use to make your jewelry? So the first question, why is your business named Painting Stone? That's a pretty good question, a question because I don't paint. But when I was a little girl, my Aunt Irene would have us go out in the woods and we would gather stones and we would bring them back and we would paint the tops of them with watercolors. When the blue ran into the red, it made purple. I thought that was the most amazing thing. And I've never lost that sense of wonder, how you can use things in a different fashion, how a stone can become a canvas, how colors when mixed together create a whole other color. So that's the point of painting stones. The painting is the renewal part and the stones are reflect to me something that we wouldn't have seen in this type of light. Um, the second question is, where do I find my inspiration? Well, I'm really driven by the object itself. When I hold something in my hand, it tells me what to do with it. So when I hold a vintage watch band, it says to me, oh, I'm tired of hanging around people's wrists. Make me into a sleek pair of earrings. Or when I have a watch rim, it says, you know, I don't always have to have a clock face in me. I could be a frame for a jewel and a, or a stone, and I can become a necklace. So I believe in my own way that these inanimate objects kind of talk to me. And that's why I have to be an artist, because otherwise I would just be an oddball. So I'm welcome all of the other oddballs like me who take different attacks and different interpretations of things. And the third question that I get all the time is, where do you find all this stuff that you use to make your jewelry with? Well, I love vintage pieces. I work primarily in metals, but I also enjoy textiles. So when I'm in an antique store or a vintage store and I see something, it just triggers in me an appeal. And again, that object just kind of says, hey, I could be transformed and I'd like to have a second life. So I fall in love with an object and then I can usually get whatever I'm looking for on eBay. And here, is how I buy things. I buy them in big lots uh, and they're always in pieces. These are pocket watches and you can see they're non-working order and they are really maybe headed for something other than a transformation. And eBay works for me because I don't want to use anything of significant value. These watches that I get, they're in pieces already, they're irreparable, so I can transform them and give them a second life without damaging something that is of antique or heirloom value. So that's how I get my materials. And I wanna show you a little bit about what I make with them so that Molly alludes to. Um, you know, people have been making jewelry from 
coins for a very long time. So that's nothing unusual. But to me, I love using shiny new pens to make pieces. And here's a necklace that I've made with uh, shiny new pennies. I uh, seal them with uh, a very strong sealer. And then I added some fringe just to have something that would be uh, a little more in of interest to it. Another thing that has proven very popular are these pieces that I do with, believe it or not, bicycle tire inner tubes. I take the inner tubes, I called the bicycle shop and I said, do you have any inner tubes uh, that you're not using? And he said, uh, yeah, I got a bunch of them in the trash here. And I said, oh, that's perfect. So I don't know what the fellow thought about this woman calling to pick up the bicycle tire inner tubes from the trash, but these are not trash now. They are woven around, in this case, white African opal beads. And here they are as uh, earrings. Again, I've just chosen to use a color in a different style. And I like, uh, I like the contrast. I like using things that are utilitarian like rubber inner tubes with a gemstone so that you can have a mix of a sort of a yin and a yang. And again, something that I've fallen so in love with and that is vintage watch bands. Here is a traditional man's watch band. Um, as you know, we don't wear watches as much anymore unless they are uh, little computers strapped around our wrist. So I thought that was a wonderful use of them to take them and shorten them and drill them and have them as earrings. So you'll see a lot of my pieces use that. Another thing I have never lost my fascination with time pieces, whether they're watches or clocks or pocket watches, I love clocks and watch pieces. So here I've taken vintage watch faces. I've drilled them and put them in a column so that they become earrings. And again, it's something that is vintage and uh, repurposed, but it still adds a bit of glamour, I think, with these glass beads that I've added to it. And my current craze are these. This is a pocket watch case. And you can see it has beautiful engraving on it. Uh, very detailed. And uh, pocket watches, as you know, are sort of a thing of the past. Uh, and I don't destroy any valuable pocket watches. As you, as you saw, they come in pieces. But what I've done is taken them apart and I have drilled the uh, beautiful engraved faces and then I've accented them with some lapis pearls and then um, a fringe uh, with the same lapis beads with a fringe also from the lapis there. So you can see again that it's taking um, a, a something that unexpected and adding um, a little bit of detail and decorative value that's, that's, uh, adds that and creates something new. And for the pieces of the pocket watch that were too heavy to be worn as earrings, I cut them in half and I drilled them and put them in this uh, semi-circle sort of pattern as earrings. And again, they are objects that are beautiful by themselves and I'm happy that they are having a second life. So those are examples of some of the things that I make. And I'd like to show you a little bit about how I make these things. And I thought I would start with cufflink earrings. So as I said before, I get pieces and vintage items in big lots from eBay. Uh, generally, these would come from estate sales. And you can see here the earrings are just beautifully done in, and they're very ornate. And we don't wear cufflinks very much anymore, but you can have your very own cufflink earrings. So when I get the the lots like this, I separate them into colors and themes so that I can have sort of an idea of how I'll, I'll approach each piece. As you can tell, one of the biggest challenges with a cufflink is removing the back 
because this would not feel very good on your ear. So as you could see all of the, uh, the clasps that have to be removed. I use all, all heavy duty uh, industrial type uh, uh, machines and pieces to do this because these are, these are generally made of stainless steel and they are built like tanks. So I take these and I cut the backs of them off with a heavy duty pair of pliers. And then I take a grinding tool. Yes, this is a bad boy. You can see right here, he, it's very uh, heavy. Um, it has a, a strong grit to it made of titanium because drilling or, or smoothing out metal is, uh, requires something very strong. I take this bit and I put it into this machine here. What is this machine? Well, it is a drill press. And a drill press is a wonderful way to do, um, to work with heavy duty materials in a way that gives you a lot of control. You put it on, and as you can see, the bit uh, wires, uh, the, the bit turns, and then you take the handle here and it lowers into the piece. You'll also see I have a block of wood here. And the wood is to catch the drill bit once it's through the metal. Otherwise, it would head directly into this solid piece of steel. It's challenging uh, to use uh, or to drill metal because it's very hard to drill. So frequently, I'll have to start with a small drill bit, do an initial hole into the piece, and then add larger drill bits as I go through so that the drill bit makes a hole big enough for me to attach any beading or ornamentation that I might want to add. So I'll show you your cufflinks and how I do that. You can see this cufflink is very uh, beautiful. It's very simple. It's gold. And when I see it, I think, hmm, I'd like to have something with that, with contrast for this gold, and I'd like to have it dangle. I do like to put fringe and dangle pieces on it because I love when pieces have movement in them. So to do that, I take a marker. Yep, just a regular Sharpie marker, and I mark where I want to drill. I put one here. And I'll drill at the top and I'll drill at the bottom. And you may say, oh my gosh, then how do you get that off? Here's a big tip. You heard it here first. You can take a marker off metal with nail polish remover. It is dreamy. When I heard about that, I didn't really believe it, but it does, and it does a great job. So I've marked where I want to drill. I have taken the smoothed out the back so that it's all smooth where the uh, clip was. And now I have to indent the metal so that the drill bit will stick to the metal. And that means it, but otherwise the drill bit, when it hits a solid surface like this, it'll skip and that leads to shattered drill bits. And I have had drill bits pop on me like toothpicks. So <laughs> I have learned the hard way to really put a good indentation in the metal so that the drill bit will hold. This is what's called a center punch. It uh, punches a, a mark into the metal. But to do it, you have to work against a super solid surface because you need it not that you need the piece not to move when the uh, center punch is on it. So you put it, this is a piece of solid steel. I put it on the pad. I aim for the uh, mark spot. And then I punch, punch. You can see a little indentation. I punch it again and a third time to make sure that it has an indentation. I put the uh, punch mark a little to the side of the uh, marking so you could see what it looks like. See the indentation? That means that the drill bit will catch. Okay, then I suit up. This is a respirator mask. Uh, when you drill metal, it makes very, very fine shavings, and uh, you do not want to be breathing that or any other type of uh, discharge from the drill bit. So I wear a respirator. Then 
what every outfit needs, safety glasses. And you can see they're made of a polycarbonate material and they protect your eyes. If I'm going to be drilling for a long amount of time, I will wear uh, earplugs because the drill is, as you'll hear, is uh, very loud. And the repetition, because I'm going so close to it, uh, is tough on your ears. So let me get my Darth Vader on. Then I'm gonna put the piece on the drill. You'll see me activate the drill. And then the uh, drill bit will go through the metal and you'll hear, generally you can hear when the bit is through the metal and hits the wood and that's when I know to stop. So let me get my Darth Vader on here. You love this look, don't you? Okay. On the bit, take the handle, put it down. Okay, you see it's cutting through the metal. There you go. I do hear it. I see it. There is the hole. Okay. I'm going to get myself back to normal. So now it's time to add forever ornamentation. Uh, or decoration or embellishment that I'm gonna add. And you can see that um, making jewelry is 99% preparation and work, and then 1% really the final touch. So this fun part, uh, I really try to enjoy and to think about because uh, it's the final step. So you take a jump ring and what is a jump ring? A jump ring is a piece of metal that is cut so that it separates into two pieces. I use, again, a very heavy metal. This is an 18 gauge uh, jump ring. 18 gauge means that it's a fairly thick wire because the pieces that I'm using are heavier metal. You take a, a second pair of pliers and this can be kind of tough because I'm using pliers like my hands because I can't bend the metal without that. So I bend, I separate the jump ring. And I take the piece here and I add the jump ring through the hole, okay, that I've just made. All right, we're in, we're through the hole here. See, that it's through that hole. Then I had already prepared the beadwork that I'm going to use on it. Let's see a, a good way to show you what this looks like. I chose carnelian. I work with uh, gemstones uh, and this is a carnelian bead. It's a beautiful red and I thought it was a nice contrast to the gold. I'm also kind of working on a holiday collection so gold and red will fit right in. Take the embellishment, I slip it over the jump ring. Then back to the pliers, take them on both sides. I'm gonna have to put this down. And I close the jump ring. Oops. And I recover it. And I finish closing the jump ring. And when I'm done, you can see the final product. You'll see that I've also drilled in this final piece, uh, a top piece, so that I can attach a jump ring to the ear post. And so this is holiday. Number one and number two, it is also something that is repurposed and reimagined. So it's good, I think, to create pieces that have stories to them. So, uh, but not obvious stories. I like when, when I'm wearing my pieces and people say, but, but what, what are your earrings? And they have to sort of look at it. Uh, and I can say, well, there, there are watch bands or what, what, what is that necklace? And it's, uh, it's a metal watch ring frame. So these are cufflink earrings. And you can see on my website, um, I try to document some of these uh, pieces and things that, that I make. Um, so that's how I would make uh, cufflink earrings. So I'm done, right? That's it, I, I create these pieces and no problem. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> when you have a small business and you are the CEO and the staff, you're looking at the staff here, a big portion of being a, a maker 
is marketing what you do. And that is something that is really a, a whole other art form and it takes a lot of time and effort. Um, as you know, uh, you also, if you're not on social media in this market, sometimes, unfortunately, you're not on the radar. Um, so I have, uh, I started on, on with a website that I created and I've had some experience, uh, professional experience with websites, so that wasn't an issue. Then I added a Facebook page, but the real artist community uh, for me in this market uh, is through Instagram. So I had to create an Instagram account. And uh, luckily I have three wonderful millennial, millennial daughters and um, they in there as daughters will tell their mother, no, <laughs> this is not right. You're not using this properly. So they sort of hijacked my account for six to eight months. And um, I saw how they did the posts and uh, it was a very uh, good awakening for me because uh, it was a medium that um, I was not used to. So it's fine to turn to other people and say, you know, I'm not comfortable in this particular medium or market and let them show you how to do it. And so through the help of these beautiful girls who are also the models uh, on my website and uh, on my Instagram account, I was able to uh, launch Instagram. And it has been uh, the single best thing I have done for my business, uh, for me, for inspiration, for um, connecting with others. Uh, the community here, the artistic community, has been so open and welcoming. And uh, I am so grateful for all of the support that I receive from them. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about something that I've been moving into outside of jewelry, because I think uh, it shows that when we're on this journey, uh, we just have to listen to those voices that talk to us. And I wanted to show you a little bit about the wall art that I've begun to, to work on here. Um, you'll, you, if you've read the posts about uh, my work, you'll see a lot of talk about belt buckles. And I'm on a mission to educate the world about the beauty, the ingenious design of belt buckles. Uh, and that mission has had uh, some success, but uh, as you can probably tell, I'm not going to give up on it anytime soon. These are vintage belt buckles that I stripped down to the bare metal, uh, copper here, steel, brass. I loved the raw metal look of them. It also reveals what they really are underneath it. Um, we're used to seeing belt buckles that have been coated um, with a uh, shiny finish, but underneath them, they are not uh, shiny. They are utilitarian and uh, I think kind of just kind of ingenious. So this is a wall hanging that I have uh, done as an introduction to some art pieces that I'm working on and not to worry because I have a drawer full of about 300 belt buckles. So you can expect much more from belt buckle artwork from me. This is another piece that was really just an extension of my jewelry work. Um, I think, you know, we, we make what we know and I knew vintage jewelry so these are uh, leaf uh, brooches that I've collected. They are Americana. Um, when I say that, it's not that they're uh, heirloom quality, but they are um, Sarah Coventry. And uh, for those of you who don't know what Sarah Coventry is, Sarah Coventry was one of the first in-home uh, jewelry sale uh, businesses, sort of like Avon, you know, when, when you'd have Avon meetings and folks would get together and purchase makeup. Sarah Coventry did that with jewelry and they made a lot of brooches. Um, leaves by uh, history are uh, very common themes in uh, vintage pieces. So I chose uh, all leaves, uh, gold leaf uh, 
brooches to use for this piece. And um, I knew I wanted to do it, but I wasn't quite sure how uh, the design would work. And well, as odd things happen, um, I woke up in the middle of the night and I saw this design. I had been walking uh, in the city and the leaves were falling and they gather, you know, when you walk in the city, the, the leaves gather on the side of the curb there in these little like piles and they're kind of all clustered together. And you can see the ones that haven't yet been blown into the a pile at the bottom. So this was my interpretation of leaves that are falling at different uh, points and measures. And then they just kind of gather at the bottom in sort of uh, a, a collection here. So um, that was the inspiration uh, behind this piece. So that's um, a little bit about what I do and uh, why do I do it? Um, I think it is so important that we all recognize that we are all makers and creators. Um, you know, you may think, well, art is just something that you hang on the wall or you wear around your neck, but that's not really true. Art is something that is made with love and passion and reflects a part of who we are in creating it. Um, I may choose to make things that you can wear around your neck or hang on a wall, but um, I have trouble making a casserole and I see people who make the most beautiful meals and they're colorful and they're so thoughtful. Um, and that is a work of art to me. And uh, I, think I, I think I have killed every house plant I've ever owned. Um, so I am so in love with people who have these beautiful gardens and they, uh, they use all of their uh, uh, vegetation and their flowers in their life. So um, I want to remind us that art is something that we create with love and that it is important for us to pursue, I think, those things that bring out the artist in each of us. I think it's important because I believe that every act of creation triggers a renewal inside you when I make a, a pair of earrings or I create a, a wall hanging with leaves, um, I feel such a sense of pride and that's a good thing and uh, a sense of accomplishment. Uh, and there are so many avenues out there for us to learn about what we, what we do and, and how we can create pieces. So don't think, I, and people say all the time, oh, I could never do that, I'm not creative and I, can say to them, I could never make that beautiful cake. I just couldn't do it. So um, all of us are makers and creators. And I think it's uh, important for us to pursue the maker and creator in each of us and also to support that. It takes a lot of guts to put what you make out there for people to look at. Um, even if it's not something that's to your taste, I have spent weeks making something. Um, my husband sometimes will say to me, well, how long did it take you to make this? And I can say two years because it took me two years to figure out what I would do with 150 vintage belts that I had bought. They sat in a big Tupperware, a big storage container in the closet until I was ready to make them and just until I found the inspiration and the, just the sheer, I'm going to do this uh, to, to make those pieces. So there, it's a lot of process. Um, and I do want to share that the two things that I have learned in this journey, I started making jewelry well, maybe about seven or, seven or eight years ago. And the first is that I fail many many more times than I succeed, many more times. And that is a fact of this journey. Um, the, what has happened to me and what I hope that I can impart to you is that it's not about failing. It means that if a piece isn't working out or the, the right look isn't coming to you, you can't get that recipe, 
right or you know you just can't figure out how to how to but put the right flower combination together that it means that you may not be ready for the design and the design may not be ready for you to see it so it's not it's not a failure it's a put it aside and wait for the inspiration to come and the second thing is that I work a lot longer on what I do than I did when I started, which kind of sort of doesn't make a lot of sense, except that I am so much more exacting in how I want things to look. Um, I have built entire pieces, collections, and then taken them all apart and started again. So if something doesn't work out, it is not a failure. To me, it's the sign that I need to step back and let the piece tell me what to do next. So, um, Molly, I don't know how we're doing on time, but um, I'm happy to take questions if this is a good, good time to do that. It is. Uh, we're doing really well. Um, we actually have a ton of questions, so this is great. Good. <laughs> um, good. All right, so let us look around, see what we got. Um, first question, uh, do you have a favorite piece or object that you've worked with? And if so, why? Uh, you know, you're not supposed to say you have a favorite piece because like, you know, if you're the parent, you know, you have to love them all equally, but you know, bonkers to that. Cause yes, I do. Um, my, one of my favorite pieces is this, uh, these pennies, you'll see them a lot. They are the signature on my uh, business cards and on my website. And um, this is important to me because it was the first time that I had taken something simple, like a penny, and created something that I felt was a piece of art. So uh, I, and I remember just doing that and stepping back and thinking, you know, wow, who, who made this? It was one of those aha moments. Um, I can do that. So shiny pennies have a, a, a big place in, in my, uh, my heart. Um, and I will never forget what they gave me. And that is the gift of being able to say, you know what? I think I can do this. That's awesome. I actually didn't realize they were pennies until I saw the close-up. So that was <laughs> that's good. Really See, that, that's part, best part of what I'm trying to do. Uh, what influence... Uh, hang on, sorry, let me, let me reread this question. Uh, what influence of any does living in Washington DC have on your work? Oh my gosh, I, it's, it's night and day. Um, I love living in the city. We live uh, downtown and um, I love everything about urban living. It's this diversity, there's different cultures and colors and languages and artwork all around me. Um, and that is just huge for me as an artist because it reminds me that the only limits we have on our art are the ones that we put on our art, not what the world does. I'm making art primary first for me because it's my journey and it's my expression. The other thing is that just the opportunities I had, uh, <laughs> worked in making jewelry for six years um, and there were no art classes uh, when I first started this. So I learned everything from YouTube. Um, so uh, that was a big transition for me because I didn't take a single jewelry class for six years till I came here and had the option to take a jewelry class. And then I took a this was so cool, a metal welding class where you know, you're holding an acetylene torch at 1700 degrees and it is, was just mind blowing to do that. So from an inspirational point of view, tremendously from an acceptance and a sense of community, fantastic. And then um, just being able to learn things. There are classes everywhere. So uh, uh, all, all around. An urban setting for me has been very, very uh, important to my work. All right. What do you find to be the most difficult step in the process of making jewelry? Oh, prep work. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. Yeah. You see this piece right here? This. All right. So I have to take it apart. 
Then I have to clean it. This is brass. So uh, believe it or not, I boil this in uh, vinegar, pure distilled white vinegar. I boil this and then I take steel wool and clean every piece of it off. So when I get it, it's, uh, it's dirty, it is tarnished and the prep work takes a ton of time. So, you know, uh, I'm going to thank my family for putting up with the fact that they'll have uh, pots of boiling vinegar on the stove with, uh, you know, uh, watch pieces in them. Prep work is really tough. It takes a long time, but you have to do it and you have to do it well because it reflects on the, on the piece. They have to be mm -hmm. separated, uh, cleaned, and then sealed all this metal before I can use it uh, in a decorative manner. That's amazing. I didn't know that you could clean brass with white vinegar. <laughs> you, boiling you white vinegar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my family would think other terms besides amazing because boiling vinegar does not smell very nice. I Probably think. not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, where do you buy the chain and hardware to add to your pieces? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I will go only to uh, certain sources. Um, I use uh, for the gemstones, I use a wholesaler, um, it's Dakota Stones, and they, um, because I resell the pieces and uh, I am a registered business, I can get the stones uh, at, a, at a retail price. It's very important to me to have quality materials to use. By quality, I don't mean necessarily expensive materials. Um, the gem, I use gemstones, um, not uh, diamonds or emeralds or, or, or per, uh, rubies, although I have not, nothing against them. Um, so it's important to find good sources. And when I find a source, uh, I really stick with it. And I have found that uh, the stoneware company is a uh, Dakota Stones has been a good uh, fit for me. Also uh, finding good, I use stainless steel. It's uh, less expensive than um, silver. And uh, it is hypoallergenic, so it won't rust. And it is, um, comes in a lot of different styles. So I can get a chain from uh, a couple of uh, jewelry places that I use. Uh, Rio Grande uh, jewelry is uh, a go-to for me. Jewelry supply is another uh, go-to. But it's very important to get good materials. So it's a lot of trial and error finding a company that whose product uh, really meets whatever standards they, they uh, you set and then that they claim to have. Okay. Um, let's see. Where can I buy a piece of your jewelry or art? Oh, hey. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you that. Uh, I have a website. It's paintingstones.com. I would also love for you to follow me on uh, Instagram. I'm at paintingstonesllc. You can also Google my name. It will come up. Um, I love when people follow me. Uh, I get such good feedback from people. Um, and it's part of my journey to share the things that I'm learning good and um, also challenging uh, along the way. So paintingstones.com. And then uh, you'll also see the links to my Facebook and Instagram. I primarily uh, use Instagram at Painting Stones LLC. Do you do commissions? Uh, you know, no, I haven't uh, for a couple of reasons. One is I have drawers full of things and uh, that I, that I want to um, tackle. Uh, so I'm, I promised myself no new items until I use what I have. And then of course I break that promise every time I go to a, a vintage or antique store, um, but, I, but I would not rule it out. Um, in particular, I would uh, really like to do um, a commission for a place that, uh, that is open to the public. You know, I, I, I think a lot about that, about, uh, bringing this kind of these ideas uh, to the public. Also, um, people will say, you know, can I give you my uh, vintage jewelry uh, to make these pieces from or wall hanging? Um, when I work, uh, I will usually uh, 
set aside 15 to 20 percent of whatever I'm working on because it won't work out. Um, either the, the piece breaks when I, they're old, they're all vintage, they'll break, um, or I make a mistake, my, the drill bit slips and I uh, drill in a wrong spot. So um, I, that's another reason I have been hesitant to take on commission pieces. Um, if it's a commission that's that that people understand that I will take very very good care of it, um, then uh, I and, but understand that I cannot guarantee that I wouldn't uh, uh, have some uh, damage to a piece. So the answer is uh, I'm I would want to consider commissions on a case by case basis. Okay. Uh, do you how do you balance a desire for variety with the benefit of having a consistent look or feel to your designs? Wow, that is that is a, that's a yeah, that's very a deep question. <laughs> that is a very I mean, whoever whoever wrote that is definitely a maker or, or a creator. Um, you know, people. There are certain things that I know will sell. I know that my. Uh, uh, Watch band earrings always sell. And I'm now excited because I had these extremely elongated bands that I had, uh, watch band earrings that I had made. And, you know, I just saw at the Met Gala that they're all the rage. So, um, so you have to have things that are what I call bread and butter pieces. Also, jewelry makers sell many, many more earrings than they do necklaces. Um, necklaces are always, in my case, at least twice as expensive as a pair of earrings, but also a, a larger fashion um, sort of risk, a design risk. So the answer is, um, I sort of bribe myself that I will say, you know, if you make a bunch of these earrings that you know will sell, then you can uh, reward yourself to, re to, to repurpose these pieces that um, that. I can reward myself with making uh, a necklace like this, or really sort of going out on a limb with an idea for a piece like these uh, uh, pocket, these, uh, these watch rim necklaces. So you have to, if you want a business, you have to make enough to bring in the, the bread and butter things, and then throw in every once in a while just something that's just because you love it. 